Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. When Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He then said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For you didn't come up with this on your own. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my Father, my Father who is in heaven, and I tell you, you are Peter, Petros, and on this rock I will build my church, different than the church you have experienced through the centuries. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples to not tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. A long time ago, in 1981, I read this passage for the X amount of times, and it finally seemed to grab my attention. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If my priests, pastors, religious leaders would stand in my council, would listen to me, if pastors would listen to God, And they would listen to God's word. They would hear it. If they would listen, they would hear it. They would speak in a way because they have listened and heard it. Their words then would be spoken in such a way that would enable others to hear God's voice. Now, I could spend an hour or two or a whole year or perhaps even eight years teaching just this one single verse from one of my favorites, Jeremiah. If my people would stand in my counsel, no. If my priests, if the ones that I've called out to be teachers in my church, if they would dial down the ambient noise and distractions, if they would remain focused, they would hear my word. And they would be better able to speak in such a way that others can hear it. Let's break it down just for a little bit. If I stand in front of you, dressed the way I am, many of you would say, oh, he's got the uniform on today black pants, black shirt, and a collar. But rarely have you seen me in a robe over eight years. I don't have anything against robes. I think they're hot. And I think for the most part, people have no idea why you have one on. I don't think people get it. I don't think people are taught it. And I think if you teach it, they don't care anyway. But I won't come into your presence without being dressed in a way that I think is respectful So I wear a collar to tell you, to proclaim to you that I am committed to the God that I see contained in Scripture and that I believe that one of the things that God has asked me to do is teach and teach simply. Teach the truth as simply as I am able. If I step into the pulpit and I happen to have a suit on, I don't do it because it's political. I do it because, you know what? I got a bunch of suits and I feel like I need to wear one once in a while. And... Interestingly, you believe that there's a difference in the voice, my voice, when I'm in a suit 
And when I'm in a clerical collar. I've never taught at the college with a collar on. I don't know if they've even ever seen me with a collar on. But I do teach, and I never teach unless I have a suit on. I'm not a teacher that believes you walk in casually, and I'm not one that believes that students, well, it doesn't really matter. I believe it does matter. And maybe perhaps because I believe it matters, you know what happens? It's almost across the board in my evaluations. They take note. What we do matters. Serve, buddy, serve something to someone on a paper plate, and you know what they think? Serve someone something on China, and you know what they think? Don't think for a second first impressions don't matter. And trust me when I say you never get a chance to make a second first impression. This is Jeremiah teeing up for the long haul. These are words from Jeremiah setting up many of us who happen to wear the uniform occasionally to the ultimate challenge. Will we stand in God's counsel? Will we listen to God first? But what if Jean and Bonnie and Jen and Mel and Paul and Bill, what if they say, Pastor Bob, we don't like what you're saying. Would you agree? Would you agree that if I hear God say, this is what I want you to teach, then I must teach it? And can you test the teaching up against Scripture? If I say, anyone that's four foot two or lower, shorter, we can't let them in this building. It wouldn't be consistent with what you would find in the Word of God, nor would it be consistent with the nature of God, nor would it be consistent with how we would love all people, which seems to be consistent with love God and love your neighbor. Correct? I happened to be at a party, a social engagement, the other evening on Friday night. And one of our senior members was there, I had a little glass of Irish whiskey. I told you, you all know that I like Irish whiskey. I don't drink a lot of it. I've never been drunk in my life. I can't be because anybody could call me at any time 24-7, and they do. And I need to be on my way. I don't tell you that because I'm not one of those priests that wants to show you the calendar. If you need it sometime, I'll show you. I think you might be uncomfortable with how busy it is. But I want you to know that this senior member also had a glass and it was full. It was at least 12 ounces. And I'm thinking that's a lot of liquid. Would you agree? But what you don't know is that it was Pepsi and it was sugar free. <laughs> and that the old guy is Paul Motes. There's always more to this story. Get to the bottom of it. They would speak in a way that would enable my people to hear my voice. What are the things that get in the way of a pastor or priest's voice? Speaking consistently about God. Can you come up with a few of them? I don't have a microphone in your hands, but if you say it, I'll say it out loud. What do you think are the obstacles for a priest, a pastor, to speak clearly God's counsel? The devil. <laughs> Someone said mother-in-law. I can't believe you said that out loud. No. <laughs> Obstinance. Complacency. Fear. Crime. Pride. Money, that's a few. In 1981, in the spring of 1981, I was preparing to run my last season in track, and I was given a book. And in that book, these words were found. Not just Jeremiah 23, these. If my priest, so I'm just reading the book, and I'm seeing 
So this is how God spoke to Jeremiah. This is how God spoke to Jeremiah, and then God spoke to me. That was it. Those words. Will you be, will you listen to my voice so that you will speak my word? And that's my response. I will, with your help. My greatest need and desire has been and continues to be your prayers. Because that's what you heard in the text today. The community that Jesus is trying to establish, what distinguishes Christian community from other communities, is the person of Jesus Christ. And the church that Jesus establishes, not the first church, assemblies were called churches. In this church, not a synagogue, finally there was something distinguishably different between the church, the synagogue, where they were waiting for the Messiah, and now all of a sudden, the cat's out of the bag. Peter says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And there's no way Peter could have ever identified Jesus as the Messiah other than the Spirit working through him because Jesus at that point in the story hadn't done anything to qualify him as the Messiah. The Spirit led Peter to say those powerful words and that's why you have the tagline, go and tell no one because there wasn't enough training Yet. There wasn't enough preparation yet. I have used, when I talk about Christian communities, take too many leaps. And I've likened it to people that go to recreational areas in the Bahamas or the Caribbean or someplace or Mexico. And they go scuba diving. And they have all of an hour's worth of training. They put a regulator, a mouthpiece in their mouth and say, go ahead, you can go to 40 feet. Where do you think diving accidents happen and why do you think diving accidents happen? Because they don't have adequate training, yet you're allowed to do it because it's an unregulated sport. Christianity should be regulated better. We should take our time and build people up in the basics, growing them, as the Apostle Paul says, into the likeness of Christ, into maturity in the faith, you don't take someone from first grade to 12th grade, unless you're Dr. Eshelman. <laughs> Do you remember Bob Eshelman and Marge? David was an MD at 21, 22 or 23 years old. He's a really smart guy. Well, I'm saying in the Christian faith, we probably can't take those super leaps and bounds. But if we slowly take them through the stages. Vicki, you've had the occasion to do something that I don't know if anybody else in this church has ever done. You've taken two-year-olds from diapers into three-year-olds to learning the alphabet and numbers so that they can actually identify on the elevator. I was with one of your former students. You and Missy had her as one of your students, and now her child is in our preschool program. And the little guy said, that's one. So he took us to the first floor in the elevator. I said, let's play a little. Let's go to two. We didn't need to go to two, but it was fun to go to two. And then we came back down. But he knew what a two, a one, and a G was. And I'm thinking, that's pretty cool. Two years old, diapers. Three years old, identifying what's on an elevator. Four years old, and transitioning into our Boyertown Area School District with confidence. I think it's powerful. What I need, what we need to be thinking and asking is I need your prayers so that I can hear and maintain the commitment that I made. I can't do it on my own. Barry Erb, yesterday you saved me from plenty of frustration 
I was at the church. I was working on a letter that I needed to send to somebody, and it was a challenging letter. It was one of those that I needed to confront something that was pretty egregious, and, and I was just in emotional turmoil, ambient noise, dial it down. So what do I do when I'm frustrated? I clean. I clean. So make me frustrated. I'll come and clean your house. So I call Barry. Barry comes over. We fill both of our dumpsters. Both of them are filled to the brim with nothing that can be recycled, nothing that can be, rep- well, some of it can be recycled, of course, the one, but nothing repurposed. We're not throwing away. We actually took out the trash that was taking up space. And by removing the trash from the lowest levels of our building, we revealed something. It would have been, we should have left it there because then no one would know that the walls are inches thick with mold and mildew. No one would know that that was air quality not compliant. But now we do. And guess what? We'll let the youth group go in there, scrub it, and then, no. well, actually, we will. We will. Will you be this kind of priest? Yes, if I have your prayers, because outside of that, I can't do this job. I can't do my calling without your prayers. And by now, for those of you that are dialing out because it doesn't make sense to you, because you've been stained with the busyness of your world, I would encourage you to engage these things and answer this question. Who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? Who is Mel Roth? Watch, if we ask five people, five people are probably going to say, well, she was the person that was at the center of a building that how many hundreds of people enter into every single day? She was the executive director of the Y. Now she works for the Y at the highest levels and interviews the people that go to the largest Ys in the country. And she lives in a town that 50 miles from here never heard of. God chose her. How many of you know who Terry Wadsworth is? Who do you say he is? I'm not asking you what you think of Mel and what you think of Terry. I'm asking, who do you say Jesus is? I can say to you, Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Savior. But so what? What is, not what, who is Jesus? Who do I say Jesus is? It's the most important question that you can ever ask. And most of us will ignore it. We will avoid it. If we avoid the simple question, hey, do you have your plans made for your funeral? I'm not going to do that. That's up to them. They can do whatever they want to do. Well, that's not an answer. That's just simply avoidance. Because when it comes down to it, it really gets dicey. And if you're in the hospital at some point and you don't have a living will, let me tell you who's going to struggle. Your kids are going to struggle and I'm going to struggle because they're going to say, What do we do? And I'm going to say, hey, if they didn't have the courage to write down what they wanted, pull the plug. I'm just joking. Who do you say that I am is a critical question. This man received sinners. He saved others. He can't save himself. I find no fault in him. The enemies of Jesus said all of those sins. Surely this was the Son of God. The enemies said that. His friends said, who do you say I am? John said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Peter said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. I'm not asking them. I don't care what John the Baptist said. I don't care what Peter said. I don't care what the enemies said. I care what the people who are in my pews, the people I work with day in, day out. Becky Shirey, who do you say Jesus is? Shannon Omler, who do you say Jesus is? Jen Frizz, who do you say? Bonnie Motes, who do you say? Gene Mockamer, who do you say Jesus is? I want to know. Yes, I want to know what time the Phillies game is. That's a great question to ask. But we already know the answer to that. I want to know what do you say and who do you say Jesus is? Don't avoid the question any longer. I've come that your joy may be full, Jesus says. 
My peace I give to you, Jesus says. Come to me, all of you who are just flat out exhausted, and I will give you rest. Hopefully in Hawaii. Who do you say I am? I am. 